Hi there. I'm Fenner Rockliffe, Compositing Supervisor at Craft Apes Vancouver and Compositing Instructor at Think Tank Training Centre. Today, I'm going to be talking about selective stylization. Now before we dive in and start breaking down exactly what selective stylization is, I'd like to just kind of show a quick demonstration of what I'm talking about first. Now I think we can probably all agree that looking at an image like this is not as engaging as looking at an image like this. Looks a bit better, right? So why is that? Well, to start off, at this point, I'd say we're all pretty darn tired of looking at everything through a webcam feed. But the truth of it is, our eyes are also just accustomed to seeing images on a screen with a certain filmic quality to them. And when these attributes are missing, the image may not seem as engaging or interesting to the viewer. Now these attributes are what I'll be talking about today. How we can take these analog camera elements and use them to not only better integrate our comps, but also how to take these elements a step further and use them to enhance and bring value to the images we create. Now, it can be easy to go overboard with these sorts of things, and we definitely don't want to take it too far. It's not just about blasting your shot with copious amounts of lens flares like we see here. That's not really what we're going for. The point of selective stylization is to subtly add in these filmic analog qualities we're used to seeing on the big screen and utilize them in a way that improves our image. These are things we may not notice are even there when we're watching our favorite movies or TV shows, but we definitely notice when they're missing. Some of the qualities we'll be discussing and showing examples of today are small things, and artists may just overlook these while working on a shot, and some of them are more stylistic, artistically driven effects. To start off, let's talk about something every compositor should be familiar with. Grain. When we think of analog camera attributes, the first thing that may come to mind is the debate of film versus digital. Nowadays, the process of adding and matching grain in VFX shots has become somewhat of an automated process, with tools like DAS grain and neat videos reduce noise being used prevalently. In the age of streaming services and pocket-sized phone screens, the preservation of grain seems to be paid attention to less and less. However, it's still important to not forget about this process entirely. Though it doesn't quite have that same nostalgic look and feeling as film, digital images are still made up of pixels in a way that's roughly analogous to the way film images are made up of grains. Both film grain and digital noise can be seen as aberrations in the images which are not present in the scene being captured, and both are a direct result of the physics of the method of capture employed. Camera grain or noise can really help to add a cinematic quality to shots that are completely CG or shots that have been captured through a video game engine, such as Unreal Engine 4. The presence of grain in a fully CG environment or game environment can really help to subtly integrate the different parts of the scene and blend them together in a natural feeling way. Like Alex was talking about, in the shots on Astronaut, you may be going from an entirely CG shot to a non-VFX shot back to back in the cut. It's important to tie these shots together in as many ways as possible. Now that we've talked about grain, let's talk about another fairly simple lens trait, chromatic aberration. Chromatic aberration occurs when different wavelengths of color do not converge at the same point after passing through a camera's lens. This process is displayed in the diagram we see here. Lenses with chromatic aberration problems can show fringing around objects throughout the image. Red, green, blue, or a combination of these colors can appear as an outline or halo around objects. It may be more noticeable closer to the edges of the frame or in areas of high contrast. This is something that can often be missed by artists when adding an element into a plate, as it's generally quite subtle in higher quality lenses. When working on a fully CG shot, adding in a hint of chromatic aberration based on the amount present in surrounding shots in the cut can help to give that subtle filmic quality and integrate and match that shot closer to the overall look of the project. Like we discussed before, you don't want to be going from an entirely CG shot to a non-VFX shot and missing those attributes that the non-VFX shot may have. Now, these first two examples may seem a bit simple, however, it's likely because of their simple nature that they can be easy to overlook and often ignored. Well, until an eventual QC note lands in an artist's inbox that reads something like, hey, uh, grain doesn't match, missing chromatic aberration, you're missing grain. Seriously, just grain the thing. Moving on from these simpler attributes such as grain and chromatic aberration, 
I'll be expanding upon what Alex mentioned earlier, probably the most commonly overused camera attribute, the presence of lens flares. There's been a trend in more modern video games and feature films to have a bit of a habit of slapping lens flares and slapping lens dirt all over the screen, even if it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Sure, if the first person video game character is wearing a helmet or has some goggles on, maybe it would be appropriate to have those effects. However, if you look directly at the sun with your own naked eyes, it's probably not going to look a whole lot like the next J.J. Abrams movie. When most people think of overuse of lens flares, they probably think of J.J. Abrams' Star Trek. But I think Abrams is probably aware that he pushed it a little far in that film. Lens flares are an effect that can often be overdone simply because it tends to just honestly look pretty cool. I'd say I'd probably been guilty of attending the J.J. Abrams School of Cool more than a couple times myself. Though it may look super awesome to just throw some flares into a scene and cover up your work, it's better to understand when and where to appropriately add them in. Optically, a lens flare is created when non-image forming light enters the lens and subsequently hits the camera's film or digital sensor. Flares are achievable with most lenses, as lenses are manufactured with several layers of glass. The light entering into the lenses will reflect, refract, ghost, leak, and more or less bounce all around like crazy before hitting the sensor of the camera, creating our image and creating that flare. Although flaring is technically caused by internal reflections, this generally requires very intense and bright light sources in order to become significant. Heavy amounts of flaring can often be a stylistic choice, and depending on the project, it may be an element that would be played up more than would be technically correct, especially in a project that is trying to evoke a more sci-fi or retro film look or aesthetic. Lens flares will also have very different characteristics based on the types of lens being used, so it's important to match the overall look of any additional flaring being added rather than just opening a program like optical flares and going with the first default that shows up. Programs like optical flares are great, however, like Alex was talking about, if you're able to capture your own flares and create your own elements library that's been filmed through that same lens that's been capturing your shots, you're going to get a nicer overall image that's going to tie together better overall. For example, it wouldn't make a ton of sense to have a huge bright blue anamorphic flare show up out of nowhere on a project that maybe hasn't actually been shot on a camera with an anamorphic lens. To highlight all of the different looks and attributes lens flares can take on, we can see here the same light source filmed with a few different lenses. Now even if the shot itself contains no intense light sources, stray light may still enter the lens if it hits the front element. This is commonly referred to as off-screen flaring and can be used as a way to essentially pre-roll and introduce a light source before it actually enters the frame of the shot. This can be easy to miss when dealing with CG as we generally just are thinking about what we can see directly on screen in our nuke viewer. Out of sight, out of mind. However, it's important to take into account the world happening outside of what we're seeing in nuke. Using off-screen flaring and reflective lens elements like we see here can really help to integrate a CG element into a scene or enhance a fully CG shot or game cinematic by making it appear as if that image is actually passing through a camera's lens that lives in that environment. Just because that source of light isn't visible on screen doesn't mean that the light being emitted isn't hitting our camera's lens. That light doesn't disappear just because we can't see it in our nuke viewer. These off-screen flares and reflections can appear as very different looking elements depending on the lens or even the source of the light. As we see here, these LED light sources are reflecting more of a mirror image of themselves rather than a nondescript wash of chromatic separation and cool rainbowy colors like we see here. These different looks can be achieved through different lenses and lens filters and are elements that can be art directed to guide the overall look and feel of a project. When I'm taking on more of a look dev role as a comp lead or a comp supervisor, I like to build out templates or like Alex was saying, contact sheets of various elements that I feel share similar attributes and feel like they could be living within the same family. By having all the artists on the show or project using these same elements, it can really help to give a consistent look and feel to the overall project. Similar to lens flaring and reflection, a common element that is often missing from CG renders are attributes such as glints and blooming. Glints will often show up on extremely bright or hot points of an image when captured through some lenses. 
This is an attribute that can really help to sell the reflective or metallic quality of an object, and the absence of this kind of effect can often lead to CG objects that are supposed to appear metallic and have a high level of specularity appearing to be dull or plasticky. Here we see an example of what some glint elements may look like. The creation of glints was used a lot on astronauts to sell the reflective qualities of the ship. In a program like Nuke, using the Convolve node with specific 2D glint textures like we see here can be a really quick way to play up this effect. You can take the spec pass or specular AOV to kind of drive this convolve so that only the very hottest points of your image are getting these kind of glints. Along with the use of glints, blooming and wash can be something that helps to sell the look of a light source or bright point in an image. Essentially having a gradual fall off from the brightest point of light, washing over the rest of the image. Sometimes this can feel a bit cheesy, so you want to stay away from overly light wrapping or washing out your entire image with blue. This pro mist style helps to soften and give a more ethereal look rather than having sharp edges to a shot. Often CG will stand out as just being too sharp and not feeling fully integrated into that environment. So having a bit of soft blur or wash over it can really help to blend it in. Another attribute that can be commonly overlooked is the presence of texture within Bokeh. It's not uncommon for less experienced artists to just stick with Nuke's default defocus or plug in a Z defocus without actually adjusting any settings. While this simpler approach may actually work for some shots, they don't by default display the texture or uniqueness that may be present in the bokeh captured through a certain lens. Textured bokeh can be added through the image option in Nuke's Z defocus, or added through programs such as Peregrine Labs PG Bokeh. To show an example of this, we can show the same CG object rendered with Nuke's default Z defocus setup, as we see here, versus the same scene with textured bokeh elements being used to drive the look of the defocus. When adding this defocus to an object or to a part of your scene, it's best to match as closely as possible to the look of the bokeh that's being captured through the onset camera. Paying attention to attributes presented in defocused areas of your plate. For instance, you wouldn't want to be adding circular bokeh to a show that's been shot with an anamorphic lens. In that case, the bokeh would be stretched and have a more oval quality to its overall shape. It's important to also pay attention to the texture qualities of the bokeh and any swirly or cat's eye distortion that may be happening around the edges of the frame. When dealing with entirely CG scenes, or again, game cinematics, it can really help to enhance the quality of the shot to have more interesting texture to the bokeh in areas that fall out of focus. We can also use defocus artistically to kind of guide our viewer's eye where it needs to go in the image. Along with textured bokeh being used to enhance the out-of-focus areas of our image, another element we can borrow from analog photography is the presence of lens dirt and dust. On set, there might be a lot of action going on, and some dirt or dust may end up on the camera's lens. These are natural imperfections that can occur while shooting on set, especially in shots that are more down-in-the-dirt, kind of gritty. Particularly in shots that are entirely CG, it can be helpful to add in an element of lens dirt being pinged by the brightest spots in the shot. This helps to sell the feeling that this fully CG environment has still been captured by an actual camera lens. Again, it's not something that should just be slapped over any CG shot, but it can really help to add an element of realism, especially when trying to play up a gritty, down in the dirt kind of action shot. This can also help to integrate 2D elements that have bright pops of light, such as a muzzle flash. By having the muzzle flash kick up some lens dirt, some texture on the lens, it really helps it feel as if, again, that camera and that lens actually live in that environment. We want to sell the idea that some dirt or grime has been kicked up onto the lens due to the hectic nature of the environment the camera is in. Along with helping a shot feel more immersed in the environment, lens dirt can also be used to help break up an image when a frame is being blown out or fading to white rather than just dissolving to a simple constant. We're really playing up that the camera is becoming overexposed and it's really, really pinging those little tiny imperfections that may be on the lens. Earlier, Ben talked about ST maps and their various uses within the comp pipeline. Lens distortion is a quality that can also be all too often overlooked in VFX when dealing with fully CG environments or when adding CG elements to a practical plate. Ideally, the onset team will have supplied the post team with lens grids captured on set corresponding with the lens and camera specs that have been used for that specific shot. We see here various examples of lens grids and how these different lenses distort our image differently.
Not only will proper lens distortion grids allow for more precise match movement tracking, it can also be used as a tool to add some realism to the shots that are entirely computer generated. By using an ST map to apply the lens distortion we've solved from our lens distortion grid, we can help to apply that same lens distortion we have in our practical shots and bridge a CG environment more seamlessly with adjacent non-VFX shots in the cut. A certain amount of lens distortion can also be helpful to break up the overly smooth feeling a fully CG shot or game cinematic can have when the camera is making a large sweeping camera move. It's definitely one of those things we don't notice all too often while watching a film, but it can definitely help to break up that flat feeling that renders can occasionally suffer from. Lastly, I'll be discussing a stylistic choice that can also often be overdone, and at the same time often be underutilized. I'm talking about a vignette. Vignetting an image can be used to draw the viewer's eye to a certain part of an image. The underlying purpose of all of these aspects of selective stylization is to tell a story within a single shot. Artistically vignetting a shot is likely the most heavy-handed, but also the most effective way to do this. We don't want the viewer's eye to be drawn to some unimportant part of the frame, but rather softly guided towards the purpose of the shot. Although a true optical vignette would be mostly uniform along the outer edges of the image, when adding a vignette in a more art-directed way, it can be used more purposefully to darken down the less important parts of the image and declutter the frame. Now along with overusing lens elements, such as flares and lens dirt, it's not good practice to just slap a heavy vignette over every shot you ever work on. However, along with the rest of these stylistic attributes, when used sparingly and in the appropriate moments, they can all really help to bring a shot to life, tell a story within a frame, and help to give an extra level of realism to CG images. All of these different elements and attributes allow us to create a more visually stimulating and interesting image overall. Essentially, these errors or unique attributes we observe through a camera's lens can allow us to capture and create a more visually stimulating image overall. These analog attributes enable us to subtly art direct and stylize the work we create and showcase the art in imperfection. To finish up and show some of these ideas in action, I'll be going through a simplified script in Nuke showing some of these analog attributes and how I've applied them to a concept render in order to enhance the overall look of the image and give it a more cinematic quality. This render I'll be working on is by no means photo real, however once we begin to apply some of these analog lens attributes that we would find from our camera, we begin to notice that the render will start to have a really nice stylized, art-directed look to it, and it gives it a more of a cinematic quality overall. So now that we've gone through and talked about a few key aspects of selective stylization, let's jump into Nuke and walk through a few of these ideas to see them in action. We see here the final render after it's been run through our Nuke script and had some of these elements of selective stylization applied. And here we have the original render without any of our comp treatment. The first thing that pops out to me when we jump between our original render and our final comp is just how flat and cluttered our original render looks. It's hard for our eyes to know what to look at. We can tell what the overall image is, but it's less obvious what the purpose of the overall shot is. In the final comp render, our eyes are guided towards the farmhouse and vehicle. It may sound a bit silly, but a quick and simple test that could be helpful to discern where our eyes are being drawn to is the blink test. Just shutting your eyes for a second and reopening them will quickly tell you where your eyes are naturally going to first when you look at your shot. We want to make sure we're not jumping right to some unimportant bush in the foreground, but rather focusing in on the purpose of the whole shot. When applying these various aspects of selective stylization, it's important to make sure your shot is in a good place before just throwing some flaring and heavy defocus over the entire image. Selective stylization should be the last step you take in order to add that extra little bit of treatment to the image before you hit render. Similar to how Alex was talking about thinking of a shot as a painting, we can also think about our nuke script as an environment being captured by an actual camera. We have the background, midground, and foreground all being built out and adjusted before they pass through our camera's lens. For instance, we wouldn't want to be adding a camera shake node after adding on lens dirt or grain it's always important to maintain an efficient workflow. So after breaking out and adjusting the CG renders AOVs and adding an additional DMP, it's helpful to run a pre-comp in order to avoid running your entire comp live. This scene has a bright sun in frame, 
so it's a great opportunity to play up some heavier flaring and kick up a bit of lens dirt on the lens. A quick procedural way to add lens dirt to a scene is to drive it by the luminance of your image. Depending on the render, a self-illumination AOV or a specular AOV can also be a good way to do this. Essentially what's happening here is we're just taking the image and multiplying it to the lens dirt element we've created. This means we'll play up the lenser only on the brightest parts of our image that would actually be pinging any contamination that may be on our camera's lens. Often, adding an additional bit of grading and diffusion can help to either play up or soften out this effect. As previously mentioned, having a pre-selected set group of elements can be important in order to maintain consistency. Across an entire sequence, we may have a wide range of artists working on similar shots. So, by having templated out lens elements for them to use, it's going to help set up the team for success and maintain continuity throughout the sequence. Because this shot in particular has such a prominent light source, I'm also adding in some additional lens elements to sell just how bright that sunlight really is. Our sun is sitting in the top screen left corner of our image, so I've kissed in an additional lens element in our lower screen right corner, motivated by that. This element is playing up the idea that this extremely bright sunlight is hitting the inside wall of our lens and playing up this lens barreling effect. Moving downstream from there, I've applied a more heavy-handed vignette to really focus the viewer's eye towards the center and purpose of our shot. This isn't a perfectly uniform vignette as we might expect from an actual camera lens. It's instead skewed more towards the bottom corners of the frame. The lower screen left and screen right corners of the shot aren't really bringing much value to the shot, so darkening them down and making them less prominent allows us to focus more on what's important. The frame begins to feel less cluttered and more pleasing to look at in doing this. For a shot with a bright light source such as this, adding a large scale flare element along with a reflection element helped to evolve the shot over time. As the camera tilts down towards the farmhouse, we see the flare element evolve and play up a reflection, raking down towards the bottom of the frame. Aesthetically, the saturated blue qualities found in anamorphic flares played really nicely as a complementary color to the warmer orange tones of the sunrise in this particular shot. Having these practical elements interacting with the movement of our scene adds some life to the image overall. As we zoom in on the render, we can see the slight red and blue fringing created by chromatic aberration. Especially in these areas of high contrast around the darker trees and brighter sky behind them. In this build, I've shuffled out our red, green, and blue channels before offsetting them from their original position with a few transforms linked together and inversed with a few expressions. These separated out and offset RGB channels are then recombined and applied to our render. Most studios will generally have a few different chromatic aberration nodes available for artists, and they can generally be more advanced and have more control than this simplified build. However, this can be a quick setup to build out from scratch if no other options are available. Further down, we have our lens distortion and grain setups. For the final render of this shot, I ended up deciding to go without this lens distortion I'd created. However, we can quickly see how it would look in our final image by toggling it on and off with the use of an ST map. The last step before we write out our image is applying the grain. Because this render is entirely CG, the grain can be applied to the entire image. It's important to take into account the amount being added to the highlights versus the shadows. We'd likely be seeing more visible grain in the darker areas of the shot rather than blanketed uniformly over all parts of the image. To demonstrate the ZD focus workflow I touched on earlier, I'll quickly be showing how we can apply a textured look to our out of focus areas. Here we have our base render and as we can see here the immediate foreground's textures don't quite hold up. By using our render Z depth pass and a ZD focus node with a unique texture driving it, we can create a more appealing looking foreground area of our image. Setting our defocus node's filter type to image, we can now drive the look of our bokeh by any texture we input. I'll generally leave the filter channel set to RGBA alpha, as this allows for more control of the texture we're seeing. By adjusting the alpha of the image by using a simple luminance key, 
we can adjust how much or how little texture we're actually seeing in our bokeh. Additionally, by gamming down your image before defocusing and reversing that grade out after you defocus, it can really help to pop out more specific bokeh texture by adding in more contrast before it processes the image. As we cycle through a few different textures, we can see just how they affect our image differently. Although, it's best not to get too unique. I hope that in listening to this talk, you'll be able to take some of these concepts and ideas into your own workflow and use them to grow as an artist. Now, I'll be handing the reins back over to Conrad so he can finish up with the final portion of our presentation and chat about how we can find a balance between the technical and the creative side of compositing. Thank you.